You know, I don't give a shit what you think. It's irrelevant. It's just a game that the mind plays. What are you feeling? This is what we can work with. Chemicals in the body, noticing phenomena. This is the feeling of, let it go, what's next? Don't try and understand, don't try and analyse, don't try and work out why, when, what. Pointless. What do you feel right now? Ako ne želiš propustiti nijednu epizodu Lut podcasta, zaprati naš YouTube kanal i primaj obavijesti nakon izlaska svakog novog videa. My name is Vinko Mihaljević and you are listening to Lut, the podcast where we explore, explore human nature and ideas of our development on both personal and societal levels. So today uh, you and I, we have a special guest. Uh, it's one of the rare episodes in English. Uh, so in front of me is Mr. Eric Dowsett. Uh, he's an expert in energy cleaning, uh, clearing. Uh, he has been practicing and teaching these methods since 1990s, uh, helping people uh, release stress and achieve inner peace through his unique, unique approach to understanding and harmonizing energy. So what are we going to discuss today? We'll be discussing, of course, energy clearing, uh, its impact on stress, uh, relief, uh, the mind-body connection, uh, and how it complements other healing practices. So stay tuned uh, for insights into achieving inner peace and harmony. Could we achieve that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, potentially, of course, everyone can. Yeah. It just depends on what we were talking about a moment ago, any karmic charge that you still happen to be working through is going to determine where, which path you're on and how, you know, how easily it is to understand this information. So if you've been working on a path that's purely materialistic for a long time, then this is just forget about it. You know, but if you've been um, waking up to the possibility that something else exists and looking at things slightly differently, then this is going to make a lot more sense. Mm. We we dived in into the topic uh, as from the, from the beginning, but uh, let me give you an opportunity to uh, to present yourself so let, uh, yourself a little bit uh, more. So uh, could you could you say? Possibly something about your upbring- upbringing, about childhood. You already mentioned your sister and, and the jealousy and things <laughs> like, like that. Uh, but w- what was your early life like? Where you have been born, and what was the dynamics, the dynamic in in, in your uh, family, uh, etc. What, well, what was the culture <laughs> like? The environment that you grew up in? Pretty standard, pretty nondescript. Um, nothing of real note. It was just a standard sort of working class childhood, same as everybody. Although, I don't know, my father, from a, when I was very, very young, uh, acknowledged that I was very different to everybody else he knew, but he didn't explain it. I don't think he could have explained it, but he did notice there was a big difference. And I started to notice too because I, I, I don't know, because I don't know, maybe in part because of the jealousy and the, the oppression and the, the really traumatic early years, um, I became much more sensitive to information and aware. And again, I didn't start out being aware. I think it was a part of a journey that began before I came into this particular physical form because I don't see that I could have got this information any other way. When I was 14, I do remember um, being at school and uh, our headmaster was a bit of a religious sort of person. And I did question, I said, well, if you're teaching us about religion, why don't you include Buddhism? And I was 14. I don't know where that came from. I had no idea. It went straight over his head. He ignored me and I just let it go because I knew that He's no way he's going to understand. He's too very focused on his own patterns and beliefs. But I thought religious instruction should include a broader range, not just his idea of what was going on. And that just died for a while. But as I got older, it started to become a bit more concrete, that concept. And I started to realize that I understood, albeit, very poorly when I look back. I was a bit embarrassed to think that I knew what I was talking about because I didn't. Um, but I, it was just like 
this whole teaching, this whole practice started to become much more real for me, even though I was still very intellectual about it. And that's a part of the danger, I think, of Buddhism, that we do get too intellectual, trying to understand it. But that was just a part of the journey. And so that uh, that and the, the force of um, the pressure that my system had been under earlier on didn't um, cause me to go to Australia and get away. And there was a very different story there awaiting, of course. And But it was just still life, just still life unfolding. I was doing a lot. But I was not, <clears throat> I was much more of a nomad. I was a wanderer. I was never fixed in one job for very long, never one place for very long. I was exploring the world. And partly because of the charge, my father, who had wanted to travel the world when he was younger but couldn't because of when and where he was born, times and circumstance. And so that charge was passed on to me. Now, well, <clears throat> many, many years ago I realised and, and f finished the process but I'd been around the world and lived in so many countries, worked in so many countries, spent time with so many different people. The charge has been completely exhausted. So now my son has no interest in travel. He's quite happy to stay at home in Australia. So the charge wasn't passed on to him, so I worked that out. And then, <clears throat> so that that was very much uh, much of my earlier years and, uh, you know, in the mid-20s as well. It was still a, a very adventurous travelling sort of a soul looking for, looking for answers to what I thought was going on. But then the, the, the looking was done outside so the answer was out there somewhere and that was that that was a relatively easy part of the journey but eventually it came to the point as a result of many travels through different countries particularly i think sri lanka that i spent a lot of time in that it became a more of an inward journey and that's when the real hard work started to face the self without taking oneself too seriously and so the inward journey into the heart and because my heart was so sort of closed and pretty freaked out, it wasn't particularly easy to do. But it was the beginning of um, a greater understanding. And that was in, in Australia, as you mentioned, in 1990 was when I first became introduced to space clearing. By, from, from who? Oh, it, it, there was a guy, a German guy, living in Adelaide, who was teaching the, the program. He was teaching the use of, you, you'd have to analyse the environment, looking for various energies, earth energies, technology, metaphysical, whatever, and then you would use different devices to change the energy in the space. I was really excited by the information the first night I did the course. It was What kind a, of devices? Oh, weird, weird stuff that you'd have to make up in the garage. Why uh coils and copper pipes and whatever. So you were doing something to restore harmony to the space. And it seemed to work because um, for a while, I, I mean, I repeated that course because it was such a fascinating subject and very, very involved. But then people in the second course that I attended were asking me to go along and look at the energy in their home. They weren't asking the guy who was teaching us, and I've got my sort of thoughts about why that was, but... Why? They, why? Um, I don't think so. <laughs> he was a bit narrow. He was a bit focused. He was very, if I can say it, German. <laughs> <laughs> and I wasn't. I was all over the place, you know. But my, I was much more, I think, in the heart. And that's what these people recognised. And that's why we, they wanted me to have a look at it. So it was a much more heartfelt process. And I, and I started to... Um, do those jobs and I, you know obviously worked because people were getting a, a, a good response good reaction but i hadn't been doing uh, the the work as a consultant for very long before um as a result of a a session with an astrologer it was a strange thing it was but um, she told me that this work, this clearing work, was very important to my own personal journey. And, uh, and I thought, yeah, 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 you know. And, and then she said, and you're doing this with your mind, are you? 
And I looked at her and I said, oh dear, she's lost it. <laughs> I said, no, I'm actually using all these devices. And she just let it go. And I let it go because I thought she was a bit over the top. But then um, a week or two later, I'm doing a house. And the usual pl process in those days was to take a large floor, floor map plan of the house and mark all of these different energies on it. It's a long process. Different earth energies, magnetic field, water, fault lines, then various electrical fields and uh, the metaphysical charge, which is emotional charge left behind in the space. Mark them all, go home, and then sit there with your little pendulum and work out what devices were needed for each one, and then spend a day in the garage banging away, making all this weird stuff, and then going back to the house and putting it all in. And that was what I was sort of taught to do in the first stages of this journey. But it wasn't sitting right with me because I don't believe that anyone knows what they're doing. We just think we know. So for someone to go into a space and then judge energy as good or bad and then try and fix it is not what I believe it's all about. But it was sort of seemed to be working, so I did it for a while. But then I came home from this one job with my floor plan and I sat there asking, okay, now what changes do we need to make? And for five hours I kept asking the same question and I kept getting none. And then I remembered the astrologer, of course, and then I asked the final question, which is the right one, of course, have the changes already been made to the energy in the space? The answer was yes. And I, I mean, I had trouble believing that, you know. Um, in those days, that was a long time ago, and I was still very innocent to all this stuff I didn't really understand and that began a journey of trying to find out exactly what was going on how can I just go in a space and make a difference like that because it was quite profound a difference uh, be before you proceed uh, sorry mm -hmm. uh, if we can uh, make uh, a base yeah so that the people could follow us so first I think that first question that I want to ask you is uh when you stumbled upon the energy clearing at, at the, in the first time, uh, have you thought that this is a little bit cuckoo? Or uh, um, as you expressed yourself <clears throat> toward the top? The, the what, only, what was your initial reaction? <clears throat> the information was fascinating. I didn't think it was cuckoo at all. And the fact that these devices that this guy was making seemed to be making a difference. I mean, I lived in a house that they, the group came to sort of experiment with and put the thing. And it made a huge difference to okay. the energy in the space. Okay. So let's then uh, define what is energy. What is energy? Oh, geez. Everything is energy. Everything is information. I think Tesla, wasn't it? One of your... Tesla. Yeah. Is it? Nikola. Said that if you want to understand the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. It's all information. I just use the word information because it encompasses energy it becomes frequency and it becomes vibration and and there we go again you want me to go down that road <laughs> it's going to take another whatever um so everything that we perceive in my understanding currently is information we talk about the mind from my understanding now again, the mind is non-local. And this I first read about in a book by Larry, Dr. Larry Dossi many, many years ago, Recovering the Soul, where they were, they were doing all sorts of experiments and searching and whatever and came to the conclusion that mind is non-local, which means, of course, mind is not confined to time and space. We believe ourselves confined to time and space. I personally don't believe anyone has a mind of their own. They have a nervous system which analyzes and interprets mind. So we see it, we interpret it, we hear it. We, it's all vibration, it's all frequency. It's all energy, it's all information. It's a bit like the matrix with all those green lines going down. You know? and, but our nervous system interprets that as reality, which we go back to what I was talking about earlier, about your expectations create the world you live in. 
and that's another story as well, of course. But then if you expect to see things, you certainly see things, but it's just information that your energy, your, is, that your way is interpreting the energy or the information. So that, for me, is energy. Can you, can you repeat, please, the, the quote from Tesla? If you want to, understand, if I get it right, don't blame me if I okay. don't. Because my, my we, mem- can, we can check as well. Yeah, my memory is not that good. But, yeah. he, um, you know, he said that if you want to understand the universe, think in terms of energy frequency and vibration. Mm-hmm. What is the difference between energy, frequency and vibration? Or Well, I think energy is just the one word we can use as a blanket to wrap it all up in. Okay. Uh, frequency is, boop, 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 you know, how many cycles per second. And uh, intensity, of course, is the um, amplitude of the frequency. And so all of that is what we see. We interpret that information through a very sophisticated, brilliant nervous system, there's no doubt about it, but it's still how we see it. We have a collective picture of what's going on. We all agree that there's a building out there and there's cars and stuff like that. But how we deal with that information is quite unique. But it's still just information. Where does energy come from? Where? <clears throat> I don't know how far back we can go because I really, you know, I mean, the Big Bang, I've got no idea where it started. I just know, according to the stuff that I've studied and the, and the practice of acceptance that I've gone through, which has changed my view of the world, that when we're born in this physical world, according to Buddhist teachings, we literally lose our mind. We forget who we are. And you can see that. You probably saw that with your kids when they were really, really young. They were in two worlds. They had, a, they had an understanding or a vision, like animals do, of a different reality. But then we gradually indoctrinate them into the physical form. We tell them, this is yours, you think this, I think that. We go here, you go there. And this is you. Yep. And, of course, by indoctrination into that process... We separate from possibly what is the true nature of mind, which is a state of oneness beyond the physical with all of this informational field. So then when we start to, um, after we've been programmed for that first six years and we start to go into the world with our subconscious programming, controlling much of what we do and say and think, then we're out there, we're giving energy by our thoughts to phenomena. And the more energy you give to certain phenomena, the more feedback you get. So another one of your questions. um, If you notice, and this is, I mean, this has become so obvious for me, not just for me, but for everybody who comes through the programs these days. If you notice where your thoughts go, if you notice a particular thought, If you're really aware, you will notice physiological change in the body. So you can think it's Monday morning, it's wet and it's cold and you're tired, a bit hungover and you've got to go to work. That creates a certain physiology. But then you might think it's the second day of a holiday, you've arrived and the kids are happy and the sun's shining and you're cool and it's relaxed. That creates a different physiology. How how would you uh, compare energy and emotion and uh, one of the questions that the questions that i wanted to ask you so we will untangle all of those things uh, sorry for asking two questions in a row uh, what is the difference between uh, emotion and feeling so let's let's break down all those things e- energy emotion feeling thoughts Then we will come to the body and everything. Okay. <laughs> and try to untangle the, the reality that, that we All live right. in. <clears throat> Ako uživaš u našem sadržaju, podrži nas i postani član YouTube kanala. Članovi mogu gledati live stream epizoda bez oglasa i pristupiti dodatnom sadržaju koji nije dostupan u javnim epizodama. Klikni, pridruži se gumb ispod videa ili zaprati link u opisu videa, to jest u prvom komentaru. A sad se vraćamo na epizodu. Energy and emotion. Let's start, yeah, let's yeah. start with that. So if you have, I mean, uh, well, look, there's many different cultures have got very different ways of dealing with death. 
Okay? And it depends on the culture to how you deal with it. So some people go and get drunk, some people wear black and weep and wail, and some people shoot rifles in the air and all sorts of stuff, a different emotional reaction to death. Based upon your conditioned reaction because of your environment, your social conditioning, whatever, you have a particular way of responding to situations. So then what happens, if, you, if we go back to this energy thing and, and all is information, if we, if we just for picture for a moment that we, we swim in a sea of consciousness, which is all information, but we have, because of our conditioned past, certain antenna that are picking up certain frequencies, that we ignore some, we, we favour others because of conditioning. And so what happens then is, in my understanding, and this is very basic biology, I'm not a biologist by any stretch, but if there's a particular frequency that passes through your environment and it triggers off a memory in your energy field of sadness, for example, then what happens is the neurons in the brain fire off in a very established order not just random, no, no, no thinking beforehand. It just goes boing and you fire off. Neurons are created as a result of that transmission, that frequency that you've passed through. The neurons fed through the hypothalamus create amino acids. Apparently they're the building blocks of life. So the amino acids then cascade through your system and enter the cell, assuming that there's... <laughs> receptor sites on the cell to allow that to happen. But if you identify with sadness, there will be receptor sites on the cell that allow the chemical, tiny little chemical, to enter the cell. We then interpret that physiological change as sadness or anger. A feeling. Yes. And it can be an emotion. I mean, it's the same, really. It's just how we interpret information mm -hmm. and the labels we put on certain experiences. Yeah. In, so in my mind, the difference between emotion and feeling was, so the chemical process, as you said, is emotion. What is happening? So you have a thought. This thought sends a chemical through the body, yep. which is emotion. This is, this is how, I, how I understand it. Mm -hmm. But the sense... So we are in interpreting this chemical yeah. reaction or action as a sadness, and this is a feeling. Yeah. 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 And it's a bit basically, the, I think it's more about the intensity of how many chemicals are allowed in the system that determine whether we say it's just a little emotion or it's a major feeling. But it's still just a chemical biological reaction in the body it's just how we interpret the information. And that depends, of course, on upbringing, on experiences, on childhood and whatever. Mm. I asked one of my guests, uh, so I had a few neuroscientists as well. And uh, as I'm a very curious person, I asked him, does a, does a person who never saw anything, so it, it was a blind person or never, mm -hmm. or it is a, a deaf person, he cannot hear anything, never in his life. Does he has thoughts? And the neuroscientist answered me that those people do not have thoughts. Well, so in the Bible, it says, <laughs> at the beginning of the Bible, it says, at the beginning there was a word. Yes, yes. So... A word is an information as well, mm -hmm. not just energy as an information, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, so basically what I concluded, but it's not a done deal, is that if there is no word, how can we produce thoughts that could affect our physiology, our emotions, our <coughs> feelings, actions, create habits and whatever? So the language is very important. Yes, yes. But then the the Hindu would say the word is Om. Om. Yeah. It's a vibration. It's not a word. Well, it could be a word. Mm. 
And that vibration is what triggers off the reaction. But you can't assume, I don't think, that that people were around when the OM sounded. As a result of the OM sound, the people became more conscious. There was a vibration put in the system that started things moving. Mm-hmm. So you, you think that we don't need words to get well, this, information? Yeah, but what, what, what's we don't need words? I mean, if if this vibration thing occurred before there was humanity, then of course we didn't need words. But as we've evolved and more and more in the body, then we become more and more diversified, more and more um, attached to or relating to different phenomena, but we haven't necessarily... Uh, evolved beyond the limits of self-imposed prison structure of the body, which is what Einstein talked about as well. Mm. I, I, I feel that we are talking right now at the multiple levels. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> multiple levels. Yeah. So I would like to go back uh, to the childhood uh, and also connect this to, to this topic that we are discussing right now with with the childhood so i was i'm i'm wondering if there is any control so when we grow older and if we are aware of ourselves more we have the possibility to to judge the information that that we got mm-hmm. and we have the ability to to find a space before we we react to something but does a child uh, in that period has any control or is it just open to all uh, outside uh, information <clears throat> well, again, especially as you said that not all children are equal yeah they have different reactions to to the experiences and different i mean you know i've seen many many different children over the years, of course, you can't avoid it. Um, and you can see that there are very unique paths that each child might be on. And if that, if we say then there's a soul journey, then the soul is experiencing another um, biological experience. And, but it's got a journey as well. It's got a history that's going to influence to the degree that the child can or cannot make decisions And so it depends, you know, uh, let's go back to me again because I can't speak for anybody else, I've got no idea. But if um, one of my experiences on this planet was as a Buddhist, a monk, I'm not sure it was, but it would certainly explain why there's an interest in that now. As a result of that, the, the charge the karmic charge that 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 body died with was much less than, for example, the guy that saw violence. His karmic charge around violence would have been very strong, which would have brought him into a situation, a family, an environment, where he was seeing that. So then his ability to, to decide would have been limited by karmic charge that he brought in with him. Whereas mine, I think, was not quite so limited because there was less charge because I'd been on the journey, on the path before. So then less charge came in, which gave me an earlier understanding or ability to understand earlier. So it wasn't a total victim. But if you've got a lot of charge when the body dies, associated with phenomena, experiences, painful, whatever, then that charge is going to limit that person's journey or it's going to create certain structure, certain directions, certain forces that it needs to process. But if you don't have that, uh, if you've got a lesser charge, then it's a lot easier to start to make decisions, start to see clearly. But it also means that there's going to be some point in this physical form where the light goes on. The light, well, hang on a minute, what's going on? And that happened to me many, many, many years ago. But in the first few years, four, no, or five, no, six? No idea, no idea. It was just, um, I mean, 
for for a start, I really can't remember that far back, <laughs> so not very accurate. Mm. But what I can remember was um, was persecution on a very serious level. Um, I didn't have any choice in that. I didn't appear to have any choice. I was a victim to that, and because you know, when you're when you're two, three years old, you don't have physical strength, you don't have emotional maturity. You are subject to the forces around you. Mm. Can you can you describe the energy in this room at the moment? <clears throat> So when 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 people say uh, colloquially uh, the energy was off, there is yeah. something about him, something about yeah. her that was telling me not to <sighs> not to trust this person. Yeah, well, I did say I'm going to try not to swear. Swear. But if you keep, if you keep putting these questions <laughs> in. <laughs> um, okay, let's go back. To try to explain that, I mean, it's not. I can't just say it's this or it's that. Once upon a time, I might have done, but if you imagine coming from a place of insecurity, you're closed down. You don't notice anything. You notice everything, but you're not consciously noticing. You're still affected by your environment, but you don't notice it. So you're shut down, which is where I started my space clearing journey from. Totally shut down. I was doing work for people using my mind um, and it was only by their feedback that they said, oh, it feels great, the house is wonderful, thank you, that I kept going because I wasn't feeling anything that was going on. And most people are like that. Or you're on the other end of the spectrum where you feel everything and you're just freaked out because you're overloaded. So I didn't feel anything. and then, But as a result of the feedback I was getting, I continued the journey. So what happens when you continue this journey, you go into space and you ask certain questions and you use a, a dowsing rod, an L rod to explore the energy of space and the pendulum to question it, whatever. But what you're doing is you're stepping into different energy fields consciously. Right? So then you're going to notice slowly, slowly physiological change as a result of stepping into a different vibration, different frequency, different energy pattern. Right? And that changes depending on the sort of energy you're stepping into, but also who is stepping into the energy. And so for me, being shut down, I didn't notice very much at all. But over a period of time, because the process of this work is to develop a capacity to be available to no matter what, to whatever information shows up, but you don't take the information personally, you don't blame or you don't judge. You just notice, you accept, and you move on, which is what space clearing can help you do, of course, even though it's an abstract roundabout sort of a way. So the more I did it, the safer my system began to feel. The safer it felt, the more the heart was open, the more it noticed. And there was a period many, many years ago when I felt everything as a great tsunami, a great flood of feelings, whether it was emotion or physical feelings, depending on where I was, I would feel all sorts of information. Then, as I stopped giving energy to what I was feeling, my system started to settle again. So the floodwaters started to recede, and it was just a trick on I'd notice here this and that as I go through different environments, pick up different feelings, notice phenomena. But then as I continue to stop giving energy or blaming or judging what I was noticing there was less and less resistance in this physical form to information that it was experiencing around in, in the environment. Less resistance means less noticing, because if we go back to the cell and the receptor sites on the cell, instead of adding lots of receptor sites for sadness, which is common, I was reducing the number of receptor sites, not just for sadness, but all phenomena, all information. So the cell was becoming much more self-aware, meaning it was starting to, to develop in a much healthier way with lots of different receptor sites on it, which the body needs to be healthy. But no one particular receptor site was dominating my cell. When that happens, you stop noticing stuff because you, you're, you're restoring a sense of harmony 
to your level, to your requirements in the environment just by showing up. No longer about doing anything. So when you ask me what's going on here, I've got no idea. <laughs> but it's obviously fine for me um, because I, I'm not feeling the need to process information. The body, if the body's not comfortable here, if this body is not comfortable here, I don't know about you lot, but if this body is not comfortable, it's not going to um, sit here and say, oh, this is fine. It will process information. And the obvious way it has of doing that is to yawn, taking a lot of oxygen into the cell to let energy, old patterns go. Uh, it, it's, it's just a process that happens on its own. But then that what that process does, it brings the energy in the room up to a level where I'm comfortable. But I don't notice what's going on when I do it because that I would have done maybe... 15, 20 years ago, but not anymore. So can't help you, I'm afraid. So if if we remove all the people from this room, would it still be energy? Of course. Here? Yeah, I mean... So, so what is the, dif the difference between energy and uh, uh, material or matter? Energy and matter? Frequency. Mm -hmm. The lower the frequency the denser the matter. Bones in your foot, for example, are I think about 30, 30, 000, 30 cycles per second or something, to 30 to 300, they're the slowest, dense, most dense parts of the body. The brains in the skull are a lot lighter, different frequency. The body itself has got all of these different frequencies. So the heart, the, the pericardium, the muscle, is about 7,968 or something. I'm not sure. Don't quote me on that. But skin tissue, nerve tissue, blood, um, all of the organs, everything has got a unique frequency. So the slower the frequency, the more dense the matter. So if you empty the building, uh, the, the room here, of course, there's still energy in the form of chi or life force. But if you keep it closed up for a, a couple of months, then the chi will just fade away and then it will become really stagnant. It'll become really heavy in here. You need to let air move again would you say then that uh, so if you said that the mind is not local yeah you said that it's all oneness mm -hmm. or one mind yes yeah that we are in temp interpreting mm -hmm. somehow uh, would you say then that the matter is also a part of this mind or no yes Yes. I, so I remember once... We, one part of us is also matter. Yes, yes. But in the flesh. Yes, yes. I don't mind if you Biological. don't matter. Biological. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I remember listening to an interview with Deepak Chopra many years ago in Holland, and he was talking to another doctor, and so the doctor said to Deepak, he said, so you're saying it's all in the mind, all of the problems. And Deepak said, yes, of course, where else can it be? Because everything is mind. Yes, yes. And it's how we've given energy to different aspects of that mind, How where we put our attention, where we focused our attention. But albeit, most of that focus has been as a result of the shadow. So we've not been consciously creating problems in the body, but while the shadow remains, it's a very dominant aspect of creating the world we live in. And if it remains hidden then it's going to create problems. Why is, this, why is this truth hidden from humans for thousands and thousands of years? How, how are we still struggling with the, <laughs> <laughs> with the reality? We're all bloody or... idiots. Because <laughs> <laughs> we refuse. No, we don't refuse. It's not like, again, your karmic charge is going to determine how evolved, how understanding, which which part of the particular journey you're on this time. And so it's like, it goes back into, well, I don't know how far I go back, I don't know, I don't understand, I don't really care. But then if we are a product of our past, then if that past has been taking ourselves really seriously and identifying with all phenomena, then of course we create that on a physical level. You can't have a cell... <clears throat> 
that if you continue to feed anxiety into the system by the neurological process, you're creating lots of chemicals of anxiety in the body, and there's a very toxic chemical, it's not very healthy, but we keep doing it, we build up stress in the body, stress equals premature aging, stress creates all sorts of problems, stress determines how we see and understand the world we live in. If we keep doing that, then every time the cell subdivides into sister cells, again, according to bi biology, Bruce Lipton and those guys, each new cell has more receptor sites on it for anxiety, for example. So then, like that, you're anxious, but you don't know why. You had no moment of choice. So really... I mean, I don't think it's possible to say we should do this or we should do that or you should think this or you should behave like that, which is what's so common with a lot of new age sort of, I don't know what to call them anymore, that, you know, if you think this and if you say that and if you change this, you change that. I, you know, if you can, if you could, you would. And you wouldn't need to be told to do it because it's a natural part of your evolution. It's like why we're sitting here talking about this sort of stuff, you know. This is a result of things that have gone on in the past that have got us to this point in time. But if we continue to give energy to old patterns, to anxiety, to frustration, without being consciously aware of it, then we create the same. And then that creates more problems in the physical body because you've got all these chemical receptor sites for anxiety, which is very toxic, which is going to create imbalance on a physical level. And then you pay the price for that. Sickness, disease, death, whatever. But sooner or later, I believe there will come a time for everybody who's sentient on the planet, they go, hang on a moment, what's going on? And then we start to look in different directions. Not looking towards <clears throat> all of the old traditional processes because they failed obviously i mean they're not working everybody's still running around like mad people trying to do more to get more but i think that again that's because according to the buddhists when we're born we literally lose our mind we forget our connection we become physical we're indoctrinated into the physical by people parents who've also been indoctrinated into the system i mean what chance do you have because it's just this ongoing process. Everybody gets indoctrinated. Everybody forgets. Everybody carries on. They try to make more, do more, run around, fix things, change things, get more, get less, whatever. Yeah. So you, if if everybody is normal, then you should get crazy, I suppose, if to everybody. find your mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, what is the? So. Um, Let us still uh, stay on on <laughs> focusing on 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 humans. Uh, I'm very pissed that in thousands and thousands of years of written history we don't have a manual. Mm -hmm. We have a manual for cell phones. We have a manual for for the car, how to drive it. Everybody, so somebody teaches us that, and we are building technology, mm -hmm. a tire, a fire, mm -hmm. a cell phone, a mm -hmm. plane. Mm -hmm. But we're not that focused on mm -hmm. an analyzing or trying to learn who the fuck we are and <laughs> how yeah. to how to work this instrument. Yeah. Yeah. It's all looking out still, looking out for the answers. But people were looking for answers. Yes, yes. For But where do they look? Yeah. In my in, in all of the the conferences I've been to, the people I've listened to. Everybody's still looking outside of the self, looking for something to do to fix whatever. Failing to recognize that they have created their own reality and if they want to change their reality, they need to change their thinking. But you can't tell a person to change their thinking if their karmic journey is taking them deeper down than a bloody dark rabbit hole that they are taking personally seriously. So the more uh, extreme individuals are, the deeper lost down the rabbit hole they go. But what's to say that that depth of rabbit hole is not their personal journey, it's not absolutely necessary for that soul's journey? We don't know that. 
We can't judge another's journey. We barely understand our own. We can't be blaming or judging anybody else because we don't understand where they're coming from or why. If we recognise that we've all come into this thing and we all tend to forget where we came from, this is why we get reset. We go back to the beginning again. It's almost like we're in cave, cave, you know, living in caves and stuff, only the caves are a bit more sophisticated. But it's still the same. And I think that's because we, we forget there's a journey, there's an experience. Life, to me, is about an experience in physical form. And I've, I've, I've had lots and lots of experiences. I believe just get as many in as you can because it's a wonderful opportunity to have experiences. And, but for some people's experiences are get up at, you know, in the same village where you were born, get up at the same hour and go to the same job and do the same thing and whatever, meet the same people, go to the same pub and blah, 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 blah. That's our experience. I can't judge that as good or bad. I can't judge that as more evolved than anybody else because that might be perfect for that person's journey so that when, and, and again, the, the whole Buddhist thing is about um, waking up more and more so that one liberates oneself from the, the cycle of the Dharma, the cycle of the wheel of becoming, birth, death and rebirth, which means then you stay in the true nature of mind. There's no individual there, of course. This is a, The individual is only sitting here. But when there's no longer a body, there's no longer the individual, there's no longer a discriminating mind. So there's no one to decide what should be done or what shouldn't be done. So I... I've, I cannot judge anybody else's journey. And I can't say that we're still stuck in the dark ages or that we're evolving or that we're not evolving. I think it's very much a personal journey. And I can't judge anybody else for where they are on that journey because I don't know. We, we think we know, but we only think we know because of our um, predilections, because of our preferences, because of our belief patterns, because of our experiences and conditioning. So when we judge others coming from a place which I believe to be totally hypocritical, arrogant, I don't know the journey of these other people. And I've, I've met so many people coming through workshops, thousands and thousands, and they're all coming from different places. But they're all exactly where they're supposed to be. So I'm not going to say, well, you know, we've, we've been on the planet for God knows how many years, but we haven't evolved. I don't necessarily think it's about an evo evolving like that. It might be that there's going to be a bit of a quantum shift in consciousness, the tipping point that people like Mal Malcolm Glad will talk about, that will flip everybody into a different state. But I can imagine any birth process is traumatic, so any change that's forced upon people is going to create all sorts of problems because there's going to be a lot of people resisting a lot of people holding on to the past, people not wanting to let go, and so it goes. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't know who's right and who's wrong. And, I, and, and again, with the Buddhist thing, it's all about letting go of attachment to body consciousness. So letting go of me, mine, emotions, thoughts, feelings, as though they're mine. They're not. I'm experiencing them, but they don't belong to me. All phenomena, none of it belongs to me. It's just what my body's experiencing and how it processes it. So if I ask you a question, who are you on a metaphysical level yeah. or a spiritual <clears throat> level, how would you answer? And <clears throat> Okay, let's start. I'm there. still, I, I, I'm still, because I'm still here in the physical form, I'm still um, possibly to a lesser degree than many associating or identifying with the physical form. But at the moment, I'm still Eric, and I'm still doing the things that Eric does, but in a very, very different way to what I was doing them even a few years ago. Perhaps one day, I will get to the point where I do let go completely, and I think the Buddha said it's the hardest part of the journey is letting go of any sense of the self whatsoever, and I can understand that. Even Jung talked about it when he said embrace the shadow and how difficult that process was. 
But if you if you do it from a, a an oblique angle, you don't confront you don't confront yourself and, and beat yourself up and trying to sort of annihilate the self by whatever drugs or whatever. But you creep at it from a, a different angle. Gradually, this whole addiction to personality starts to fade away, and it will just happen a gradual process, which is where I'm at somewhere on that journey. So would you answer that you are energy on a different Well we're equation? all we're all energy. I or mean, would you say that you are the mind? No omnipresent no, no. or Oof, oh, no huh? no. Well to a degree, but not absolutely. If the mind is non local Are you part of the mind? Well we all are. Mm -hmm. Including the table. Everything is a part of the mind. If, according to the Buddhist teachings, everything is a product of the mind. Everything. But it's not our mind. Not the individual mind. No. Because the individual doesn't have a mind, but the individual contributes to the mind by experiences. I don't know why, but a song from Nirvana came into my mind. <laughs> never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Mind, never mind. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So what do we do with this practically? I, I can hear questions in my mind of, of, uh, of yours. Okay. <clears throat> so if, if, the pra if the practice of, you know, developing your ability to clear space and people depends upon your ability to accept information, without blaming or judging. But first of all, you've got to notice the information and understand what it is that you're noticing and why. When you say information, you, th you mean frequency. information from other people, from the, from environment. the environment? Everywhere, from, yeah, yeah, wherever. Okay. It, doesn't, no, it doesn't matter where. And so we start to notice. So if I were to, uh, for example, work with you and you had some sort of subconscious anger issues that you didn't even know about, then my system would pick up an energetic transmission of yours, which we do all the time. We're all, I mean, this is just a big mishmash of information exchange, but I would do it consciously. So then I would notice charge that you still carry, even though you may not be aware of it. When I notice charge, if I judge your charge, if I take it seriously, then we're in the game of tennis, going backwards and forwards, and there's no resolution you actually going to feel more and more uncomfortable. There's a very quick example. Mother and daughter. Daughter came to a workshop, understood things differently, went home to see the mother, didn't really have good memories of meetings with the mother. They, they put them in the same room and sparks would fly after minutes and tensions would rise and things would get thrown around, words, pots, pans and stuff. But this, this particular day, this woman went in to meet her mother But she recognized that the feelings, the chemicals that weren't hers, if she didn't give them energy, what would happen? So when you, you get two people coming together, particularly close people, mother and daughter, who've got very similar genetic makeup, of course, bring them two together, and that each is transmitting information subconsciously about their past, whatever. The, the information hits one and then sets off a, a reaction, a neurological reaction, creating more chemicals in the body. You judge those chemicals as uncomfortable. You blame the other person for making you feel uncomfortable. Your body goes into shock, creates more chemicals, cre gets a stronger charge. You transmit stronger information to the other person. They react again, of course, and within minutes you're throwing things at each other because The chemicals that you're creating in your body, you are creating in your body, are toxic. And they don't feel very good. They make you feel really uncomfortable, unsafe. When you feel unsafe, what do you do? You blame, you lash out, you point the finger, you say, this is your fault, and it's common, of course. But this woman didn't do that. She didn't blame, she didn't throw the thing back at her mother. She said, oh yeah, this is that feeling again, and let it go. Okay, then the mother could throw as much of her energy at the daughter as she wanted, which they're famous for, keep moving the goalposts, but she could throw as much energy as she wanted at that daughter, but the daughter didn't react on any level. 
So the charge that the mother carried into the room collapsed very quickly instead of being built to an uncomfortable level. The daughter came into the workshop on a Sunday morning and she had spent the best hour and a half of her existence with her mother. No conflict whatsoever. Because she didn't identify with the chemical. I mean, we are victims to chemicals. It's just madness when you think about it. This tiniest, tiniest, tiniest chemical in the body and we give it so much power. So the work is about noticing these chemicals understanding what's happening and why, so we don't have to give them any more energy whatsoever. It takes a process, it takes practice, it takes a while, of course, to be able to do that, but gradually all of the stress on the cell gradually falls away, the cell becomes much more relaxed, the body starts to relax. When it's relaxed, the body can heal itself. The body can't heal itself if it's in fight or flight, it's struggling all the time to maintain status quo, but there's no energy in the body for healing. When the body's relaxed, feeling safe, healing can occur. So we try to put that system into as many people's lives as possible where their system can relax and they feel the change because the body's no longer struggling. So the more often you can put your system or anybody's system into an environment that's much more coherent, much more peaceful, much more compassionate, then your system will gradually relax more and more and more. So, so what, what are the practices that, that, that you personally do or that your what students... Teach, yeah. yeah. Um, what, what practically? If is it, we is were, if we were doing of a, space clearing... Mm -hmm. Uh, the people are armed with a little piece of wire that can pick up information. Just it helps the. I mean, the, the system is passing through information all of uh, the time. Could you just please come closer mm -hmm. to the microphone? Yeah, the system is picking up information all of the time, but it doesn't. It doesn't discriminate. Doesn't determine. Doesn't understand what it's picking up because the autonomic nervous system takes over. We're too busy in the mind, thinking of this, thinking of that, thinking of going down the pub, thinking there's time up, time to go home, whatever. So we don't really notice what's happening. So what we do is we try to get people to slow down and move through the environment, asking a particular question about some energy in space. In their house? Doesn't matter, house, office, in the garden, whatever. It's not important. <coughs> Just trying to determine what's happening. And so as that body then moves through the environment, it moves into certain energy fields that it's been focused on. It's put its intent to locate this particular energy frequency pattern, which we give it a name, it could be earth energies, whatever. And so as we move into that field, we notice physiological change as a result of moving into a different energetic field. So when you... So practically, when you move closer to something in, in this environment, in the house or whatever, your body reacts body and it gets reacts. stronger. The closer you get, the stronger it is, mm -hmm. depending again on how safe you feel, of course. But how, how do you measure? We don't measure. There's no, no. It's not empirical. We don't measure. We, we measure it by how you feel. But how you feel is very subjective because you're – system may be more comfortable with that information than that information than the other person so there's no so, way so when i'm closer to my wife then you notice that my energy is fucked up <laughs> well i i could I, i could give you some but then i don't want to get i mean i'm not going to do it on air <laughs> <laughs> i'm kidding my yeah. my wife knows that, that i love her yeah 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 well fortunate that <laughs> <laughs> does help. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so any time you come into contact with another or an environment, your body's reacting all of the time to external phenomena. Mm -hmm. True thoughts as well. Yes, yes, but you don't normally notice what's happening because you're too busy, preoccupied, thinking about this, thinking about that, unless it's an extreme. Situation. But you notice that through communication with the person. Yes, yes. And as you, pr as you work... With this, with this method, as you approach a particular energy field that you've uh, requested, so let's say I'm looking for um, stress in a person's body, which we were doing a lot in Wales, 
you move towards that person and you'll notice the closer you get physiological change. The person who's sitting there will also notice change as the person gets closer. So we notice the body's reacting to the energy of another. We know that it's reacting to the energy of another and if the other moved away, the feeling would fall away. Okay? So then we say, oh, well, that's a feeling of whatever, but it's not mine because it's just walked away again. So the feeling has passed. It can become mine if I give it energy by putting my attention on it. So if I think, oh, I'm sad, and I've had people do this all the time on, on Skype conversations, Zoom calls, whatever, where they, they start talking about how sad they are and within three or four minutes they're in tears. They've talked themselves into sadness. If they notice sadness and they stop giving energy to the chemical of sadness, then sadness will pass out of the system, I'm told, in 90 seconds. But if you say, I'm sad, that's a disaster because you're just telling the brain, oh, let's produce more chemicals because we're sad. Brain's not discriminating, it's not judging, it's just doing what it's told. But how do how do you stop this or make a cut? So, w what is the practice of becoming more aware? Of? Okay, so you move into let's say you stand on a particular energetic field and you notice physiological change in the body as a result of making a conscious connection to a different energy field. Then you step back and the feeling goes away. You step into it and it comes back again. Step away, it goes away again. <clears throat> so you say to yourself, this is the feeling of, and it's associated with that. But the feeling itself is not mine unless I choose to give it energy. So the goal is to get stronger than your environment? Not stronger, to not learn to dance it. with it, to be in harmony with it. So you're dancing with all information, that your heart is feeling safe enough to dance with all frequencies without taking any of them personally. It's a practice, it takes time and a bit of dedication and perseverance, but it works. I mean, I've taught thousands of people and they're all doing it and they're all very happy. They go through speed bumps now and again because they haven't, yet completed their real understanding of what's going on. There's still a, an element of, you know, the shadow showing up and they freak out when they see that and they ask for help. But basically people are developing the ability to notice phenomena as a result of consciously stepping into it, understanding what you're stepping into and that not giving energy to the feeling. So instead of saying, I am, which is conditioned, process, I'm feeling this, I'm feeling that, we say, this is the feeling of. Oh, cool. Take a breath, ask yourself what's next. Do not continue to give energy to an emotion. It's a slow process, as they say, it takes practice, but you get, if mm. you practice, you'll get there. It's inevitable you'll get there. So, basically... One of the changes is, is the change in the language that we use or the, our attitudes. Yep, yep, yep. Simple. Never say I am again. But then I can say never, but people are going to do what they do anyway because they don't give a shit. They don't really listen to me. They're listening to their own inner guidance, their own self, their own charge, their own karma. So I'm not sad, but this is, this the, is the, the feeling, feeling of, of sadness. sadness. Yes. But if I want to say I am rich, or this is feeling of wealth. Well, at the, moment, at the moment, it's not about judging one as better than the other. Because we exist, <clears throat> most people exist in a very polarized consciousness. So they have preferences. They like this, they don't like that. They want this, they don't want that. This judgment of good, bad, right, wrong has a major impact upon that person's life. 
Uh, and you go into another story, but if this is what your judgment exists within these parameters, then your reality is going to show up within those parameters. And you're going to have to decide whether to do this, to do that, go here, go there, want this, want that. So you're in conflict with the self all of the time. If you practice this acceptance through clearing or any other way that you can get it together, then what happens is that polarization gradually reduces. So you, now you notice a feeling of sadness, but you don't judge it as good or bad. This is sadness. Uh, so what? What's next? Because it's a tiny chemical. Are you going to be a victim to chemicals? Or are you going to notice and let go? So you say, well, that was a feeling of sadness. Okay, cool. What's next? That's the feeling of being really happy, really healthy, whatever. Okay, let it go. And as we continue to stop judging, obviously what's going to happen is these are going to come together. Then the mind quietens. Then you start to access more information from the non-local mind, this omniscience, omnipresence, omnipotent thing. Start to get more information. But what shows up for you on your journey is this, not this. And that's one of the hardest things for people to comprehend because everybody's trying to understand it from here and you can't but by practice you can bring this closer and closer together less and less judgment quiet the mind and then you don't have to make a decision about this or that because what shows up is a reflection of who you're becoming not who you were so if you were was an angry person then anger is showing up all of the time and you're having to deal with it but if you're a peaceful person, if you're a compassionate person, then compassion shows up. Nothing to do, nothing to deal with. No conflict anymore. Yeah, what I'm thinking about at the moment is I'm always struggling with balance. Uh, so you said let it go, for example. Mm -hmm. Or detach. This is my how, how, I, how yeah, yeah. I heard you, uh, detach from the chemical or mm -hmm. the feeling, okay, this is sadness, okay, this is happiness. Mm -hmm. It's not that I am happy or that I am sad, detach. Go with the flow, find peace, accept, okay? And then the thought that pops into my mind is, are we just going to be like a leaf on the wind, idle somewhere? Or I need those emotions to to do something. Oh gosh. Yes, yes. I, I can a common common question. Is it the question that arises because of the polarization of consciousness? Mm -hmm. If there were no polarization of consciousness, that wouldn't arise. When you are in this place, you recognize that here you were a leaf in the wind, you were being blown by emotions. You were being, you were being um, attracted to this, rejected to that. You were wanting here, wanting there, going here, going there. So you're, you're a victim to the shadow that still exists in uh, the backpack in the psyche, deep, deep buried stuff. What we do with the clearing is gradually every piece of information that you notice consciously that you say, oh, this is a feeling of. So imagine your backpack, your shadow, has got thousands and thousands of pieces of a jigsaw puzzle in it. Every time you say this is a feeling of, you take a piece of the jigsaw puzzle out and you put it on the table, bring it into conscious awareness. No longer here, now it's conscious. The more you do that, the more picture you build, of course, until your jigsaw is complete, nothing left in here, totally different world unfolds. But it's not something you can understand from here. And it's not as though, I mean, as my understanding is that the Buddha uh, attained his, in or Gautama attained Buddha state when he was about 40 years old. He lived till he was 80. And I don't think he was a leaf blown around India. 
I think he was a very quiet, calm, contained, understanding, compassionate person with a lot of wisdom who still experienced life. You're not, gonna, you're not just going to fade away when you collapse there. You're not going to disappear in a little cloud of smoke and a little pile of ashes on the chair. You're still going to be in the world. One person that I that I heard uh, talking about a similar topic uh, was similar question that I asked you right now. So whether to do something to be happy, or this is a feeling of mm-hmm. happiness, uh, or if you are being happy, or this is the feeling of happiness, then of course you would have. Uh, if if I can express myself, implicit need or will to do something. Mm -hmm. So if you are feeling happy, let me express myself on on the old beliefs, uh, then you would be doing something, moving around the world, helping people, being productive, whatever. Yeah, yeah. But it doesn't make me happy. I don't feel happy doing it. I don't feel sad doing it. It's just what I do. Because, I mean, once upon a time, for sure, while I was still in that polarized consciousness state, more than I am now, I don't know where I am. What do you mean by polarized consciousness? Well, judgment. Like, dislike, want, don't want. Duality. Yes. Mm -hmm. While you exist in that mind of judgment, then all of this is, all of these questions that you throw at me, that everybody throws at me, it's all the same, is coming from that place of polarization. When there's no polarization, there are no questions. It's just an understanding and a deep, I think, a deep joy, a deep peace with the world. So, so maybe we, we could just look at ourselves until the end of the podcast and not ask any we questions. Can, you can do if you like. Just imagine, <laughs> just imagine that there's a mirror in front of you. Yeah. And everything you see, everything you experience is a mirror of who you believe yourself to be. Let's, let's then look <laughs> at ourselves. Yeah, well, I've, I mean, I've looked at the self and I've looked at the self through eyes of others for many, many years. No, uh, it's not a problem anymore. Who is older, you and me, or me? Well, I don't know how many lifetimes you've had it, but if we're going on this particular body, then I would say I've been in the body a lot longer than you have. Mm. How do you know how many lives did you have? I don't. You don't know? No, no interest, don't care, don't want to know. Mm. Maybe one day I will know. But then by the time I get to that place, it won't matter anymore anyway. And uh, at the moment, I don't think it's possible to know. It's just an ego, sort of a game. Hmm. And I have no idea. So uh, besides those uh, theoretical, so everything starts from theory. So you need to share some information uh, to other person, like in your workshops. And this is the first phase of, of change or learning. Hmm. So is it? But those like, are those are my words. You can you can say. Yeah, no, I'm not sure. It's the first stage of change. I've no idea. You know, I mean, you say how? I mean, I'm this physically. This is body's older than your body. There's no doubt. But how experienced? How far down this particular path you are? How easy it is for you to understand? How you will be ready to just flip into a different state of consciousness? I have no idea. Well, I don't know about this one either. I've got no idea. It will just happen if and when it happens. But ultimately, if we continue to change who we believe ourselves to be in this moment by this is the feeling of, very simple, not I am, this is the feeling of, okay, let it go, what's next? Oh, okay, another one, oh, this is the feeling of, but okay, being there, done that, what's next? Stop feeding the emotional charge. The cell will naturally gravitate towards a much healthier state of being. That in itself has got to be worth doing. But you can still notice. 
Yes, yes. So, for example, if I ask you right now, what is this feeling of? For me? Your, for you. <sighs> you can notice it. Yes, yes, but it's, it's, a, it's just an absence of extreme. But you are detached, not fully. I wouldn't say detached, I'd say not attached. Okay. Detached is like, I don't care anymore. That's not true. Non-attached is noticing phenomena but not buying into it. So that would be my choice of words rather than say detached, non-attachment. It's a big difference. So are, are there some uh, different practices? So people come to your workshops. Uh, what are the next steps? What would people do by themselves? Oh, yeah. Well, are there, are there some kind of a typical uh, or standardized, standardized uh, things like meditation, like uh, breathwork, like nothing like that? No, no. What, what kind of practices? Well, it, there, there are two basic courses that I offer. Personal clearing and space clearing. One obviously works with another person and, and goes through that journey that way. The other goes through the journey of exploring space and working through that. The people take home with them the understanding of what's going on and a different way of looking at their world. So they'll go home and they'll practice, whether it's personal clearing or space clearing. They're, they're given the, uh, the tools to practice space clearing. They're given a little piece of information to help them understand. And they go and practice. And whether it's space or personal clearing, people will go home and practice it. How do I practice personal clearing? Um, well, apart from coming to a workshop, I would say you would begin by noticing how you feel around another person. But first of all, before you can step into that world, you've got to notice how you're feeling right now before you step into it. Because if you don't notice what's going on now, you won't notice when there's any change. Okay? So you work on noticing what's going on for your body right now. And then you can say, well, at the moment, I'm not feeling much, blah, 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 blah. But then when I think of someone, and now think of your youngest child, and what changes do you notice as your attention goes to your youngest child? Physiological change that you notice. Okay? And then this is a feeling of. Now think of a guest that you were a bit challenged by. How does that make you feel? Notice physiological change because you've changed your attention, you've put your focus on somebody else, there'll be a different chemical produced because of different memory. How does that make you feel? Oh, this is the feeling of. So you do that a few minutes as often as you can through the day. As often as you can will be determined by karmic charge, by your past. But if you start, if you start saying, oh, hang on a moment, this is the feeling of, then you're not giving energy to that particular chemical, which means gradually the receptor sites on the cell are going to gradually change and come back into balance because you've made a change. So tomorrow you make another change, tiny, tiny little change. The next day another little change. And before you know it, a lot of the old situations that troubled you will no longer exist because you've changed the way your body is relating to information. Pretty simple, really. The work is so, so simple. It takes most people years to understand because they try too hard. It's an intellectual process. What we're trying to do is get people out of here, down to here. What are you feeling? Not what you're thinking. I don't give a shit what you think. It's irrelevant. It's just a game that the mind plays. What are you feeling? This is what we can work with. Chemicals in the body, noticing phenomena. This is the feeling of, let it go, what's next? 
Don't try and under- don't try and understand. Don't try and analyze. Don't try and work out why, when, what. Pointless. What do you feel right now? So, what are your thoughts on meditation or visualization or practices like that or prayer? But. I don't have many thoughts on any of those. Um, meditation I find valuable, of course. We do that occasionally during our personal clearing workshops. Um, it's nice to get things settled a bit. And, you know, it depends very much on the individual, how quiet they can get the mind. It also depends on who's leading the meditation, how quiet they can be to support the collective quiet mind. But, I, you know, I mean, the more you can do that, I think the quieter you become. But still, we live in a world, and we should be in that world, not hide away from it. But all the rest, I don't believe in it. I think it's all just... Hmm. So how do... One of the questions that I wanted to ask you is the connection between mind and body. Um, before we started, I did not know that your belief of, of the mind was that there is one mind mm-hmm. that we are individually experiencing it or viewing from this point of view, yeah. if I can express it myself this way. But what about mm, the effect of, of the bodily uh, movements? For example, if, if, if I do a good workout, mm-hmm. how does this affect the body, the chemicals, in the body, the well, mind. <clears throat> again, it depends, doesn't it? You can't say it's going to have this effect or that effect. It depends on uh, how extreme the workout is. Do you get sweat and get rid of a lot of toxins out of the body? Do you put yourself in an altered state for a brief moment in time? Or are you just messing? You're just sort of playing around on the edge. And again, that's a, a very personal journey, a very personal thing. And I don't think we can say, well, it will do this or it will do that. But then you notice, I mean, the whole would, I mean, not everybody goes around, you know, doing lots of exercises and stuff like that. I don't, don't, you know, I mean, for me, it's just never been a part of my life's journey. If it's a part of your life's journey, you will do it and you'll get the benefits from it by putting in the energy and, you know, feedback from the body. I don't apparently need to do it. It's not part of my journey. So I don't think about it. I don't sort of try So is your belief that nutrition, good sleep, workout, it's not important for the health that we No, can... no, no, not at all. But um that we can influence it more um by our But if you're already inclined, a lot of people like you can look at certain cities in America where they got no fucking idea about diet. No idea about exercise. No idea about different thinking. They're all just locked into a very and you can look at different cultures where they're fitness mad, you know, you can look at different cultures where they're all into yoga and sort of trying to sort themselves out. <clears throat> so it becomes very much a personal part of a journey. You're either that way inclined or you're not. If, and there, here we go, the, <clears throat> one of the sayings of the Buddha, it's not what you eat, it's who is doing the eating. So it's not what you think, it's who is doing the thinking. It's not what you act, it's who is doing the acting. Um, before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. Or get someone else to do it for you. <laughs> But I don't think he said that. Um, and so what happens if you're still chopping wood and carrying water, what happens is the person or the identity, the association with the task changes. So there's no longer any resistance about the charge or the judgment or what you're doing. There's a flow of energy, which is you in harmony with the task. Because the resistance, which arises from a judgmental personality, ceases to exist. If a part of my journey has led me to a point where now I, I eat all sorts of food, but we do try and um, focus on organic where we can, and we, we, we can do that reasonably well in Switzerland. 
So then an I cook, I do a lot of cooking, so I'm very conscious of the energy that goes into the food. And I'm very conscious of preparing it and how we eat it. So that is important. But that's just part of who I am at the moment. I mean, not many other people spend so much time cooking an evening meal as I would. I mean, I've got the time now, which is nice because it's split up. It's a nice balance from all this other stuff I'm doing. Um, <clears throat> lifestyle, again, it depends, you know. You see, you look around and you see people's lifestyle, well, that's pretty sort of grim, but that's where they're at. You, know? you can't tell them that they should be doing this or should be doing that. They'll just go to you because they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. And if they could do it differently, they would do it differently. We all would. If you look back on the choices and decisions you made in the past that you might have some regret for, for doing or saying, think about it and think, did you have any choice when you made that decision or when you said that thing or when you did that act? Did you really have any choice? And you didn't. That was who you were at the time. And so if you accept that was who you were at the time, you don't have to sort of do anything about it. Don't blame yourself. Don't judge yourself. Don't go into recrimination. Just notice that that was who you were at the time and accept it. And now something happens now. This is who you are at this time. That might change tomorrow. Then you'll be then, this is who you are tomorrow. But you can't be who you were yesterday three weeks ago. You're just a product of your past playing out a particular journey. I have one last question for you. Oh, right. Before we go to the questions of the audience. <clears throat> oh. <clears throat> uh, have you had any experience with uh, psychedelics? I've tried lots of little sort of semi-legal, illegal substances in my journey, of course. I don't have an addictive personality, so I'm, I just noticed and let them go, noticed, let them go. What I did notice was I wanted to try and get to that state without using drugs. I've never done ayahuasca, never been drawn to it. I'm not, I did mm, no, no acid. I didn't do the, I wasn't a part of that sort of movement at all. I did do mushrooms once or twice, which have the similar effect. But I, I, you know, it's just another experience. I think the, the issue with anybody doing that sort of stuff is you're going to meet your shadow, which might not be very pleasant. <laughs> so think twice. So what, what have you learned from your shadow? What have I learned from my shadow? That it's just a, it's bullshit, basically. It's not, it's not anything that belongs to me. It's not my shadow. We've done a lot of shadow work in workshops, personal, personal uh, residential programs, and what we've discovered is everybody has the same shadow. They just use different words for it. Now, there's certain you know steps to take to try to reach this conclusion, but if <clears throat> if we are not the body, the mind, the personality, then what are we? We're information, we're energy experiencing life, just how we interpret that information. And so, of course, when, um, when shadow aspects show up, we don't even know they're shadow aspects because they're in the subconscious. I mean, obviously, you're not going to know. The only way you know is who you meet on the road. Do you have continual problems with one particular type of person Do you have a, a repetitive pattern of situations arising in your life that challenge you? Do you keep stumbling over the same blocks? These are aspects trying to show you that these are your shadow, which is why I said earlier, just imagine a mirror, because everything that happens to you is a reflection of who you believe yourself to be. So if there's problems, if there's conflict, then look at it, but understand what's going on rather than blame. And so this whole thing about, I want to do this, I want to do that, I want to go here, I want to go there, that just falls away because that's still personality based on judgment and preferences. 
collapse that. So one thing that I will take from this uh, conversation is uh, that this is the feeling of this. This is the thing that stayed with me the most. Yep, and that's the simplest thing. What What would be one more thing that you think that I could or the viewers could get or take uh, with them from this conversation? Um, <clears throat> without giving you some sort of uh, some sort of exercise, it's very difficult. But if you and there, there is a, a video on my a training video on my website about this thing, so six, fifteen, sixteen minutes. It's very simple. So what you do, you take a a folder or a large envelope. And in that folder or large envelope, you put photographs, news headlines, people's names, whatever, right on pieces of paper, and you put them in the envelope. Don't put your worst nightmares in there. That's a recipe for disaster. You'll get depressed. Put pictures of sunsets in there. Put pictures of hummingbirds and butterflies and flowers, not just all horror stories. So you've got a mix of information stored in the folder, okay? As you pass that folder at home and you walk past it and you think, oh, hang on a moment, what's... Take one out at random and look at it, one picture. Could be a name of a person, whatever. And notice how that makes you feel. Huh? Oops, that's the feeling of... Put it away and walk away from the folder, but do not take the feeling with you. Leave it in the folder. Huh? So this is another way of saying this is a feeling of, because it's training you to, to, to observe what's happening when the body's stimulated in many different directions. You notice and you let go. Notice, let go. Notice, let go. And if, if you want to go any further, of course, then you better come to a workshop, because... You know, it's a very complex in some, in many ways, but in some ways it's very, very simple. So when is the next workshop in, in Croatia? In Croatia, October. It's just a weekend on space. This clearing. year? Yeah. Okay. October 18th. October 18th. Apparently. I would, <laughs> I think uh, you might. Yeah, yeah. So unless you want to go to Canada next month or something. Yeah. So thank you for the, for the interview. Mm. Uh, we'll be going to the... Uh, questions from the audience and uh, all of you that you're not members. Uh, see you next time. Bye. Okay. Edit. <laughs>